Welcome to Musicians Roundtable. I'm Jeffrey Goodman. I'm recording this from Los Angeles, and we're happy to have as our guest Stanley Yates. Stanley is in Clarksville, Tennessee. And today we're going to discuss the works of Venislas Thomas Macheka. And so welcome, Stanley. How are you doing today? I'm great. I'm really happy to be here to talk about this shadowy figure of of Macheka, and uh, thanks so much for providing this forum for us to talk about this. Absolutely. So could you could we begin by just having you discuss a little bit about your own uh, discovery of his music and what the history of that is? Oh, well, uh, you know, that first Grand Sonata, the big one, um, I somehow got hold of a of a facsimile edition of that when I was still in Liverpool, probably around 1980. And uh, so, of course, you just look at something like this and you and it's like immediately, oh, this is really interesting. But in those days, uh, it was not so easy to search for things and find other music. And I wasn't really interested in that kind of thing at the time. Anyway, I was more on a concert path, you know, but um, uh, yeah, but that piece always stuck in my mind because it was like such a startling thing to see that that exists. And I, I was always like, I wonder if someone's going to play this at some point, you know, but um, I, about 20 years ago or something, uh, around 2000, I got I got very interested in 19th century guitar music, uh, much more so than I had been in the past. And um, and I got interested in sonata styles and sonata forms thinking this is a good way to kind of look at what the guitar was doing in, in those days. And with the help of uh, some of my kind of musicology friends in Europe, especially Eric Stenstad Vold, who was doing lots of research into his own areas. Whenever he came across a guitar sonata in a library or an archive or a catalog, he'd tip me off and I'd get them. So uh, it was in that process of collecting tons of 19th century guitar sonatas that I, I collected 12 sonatas by Macheka, uh, who I only knew by the one piece, you know, previously to that. And, I, and of course, I'm looking at these pieces and thinking, well, these are incredibly interesting pieces, you know. Uh, so that's how I, I kind of came across that. Yes. So since he is a, a bit of a shadowy figure, could you introduce a little bit uh, for us about his lifetime, his career in Vienna and so forth. Yeah, so uh, I think we have to talk a little bit about before he got to Vienna. He, he was Bohemian, which would be the Czech Republic now. He's from a musical family. His father was a choral director and his, his mother, I believe, was the daughter of a professional composer. And he studied music as a, a, as a child. And then he entered the seminary when he was probably 16 or 17. Uh, and there he studied cello and, and piano, and um, he studied piano with a very important teacher, uh, Jelinek, who was personally associated with Haydn, Mozart, and even young Beethoven. And uh, so he got a very high level musical training and he, he entered law school and finally abandoned law, moved to Vienna, and he set up as a, a professor of piano and guitar. Now, we don't know where he first got hooked up with the guitar, perhaps in Vienna. Um, but he, he, he converted his energies into the guitar in this very early experimental stage of, of figuring out, well, you know, what can we do with, a, with, a, with this instrument as an instrument of, of artistic composition? And he started writing very ambitious pieces for it. So that's what we know about Macheka and the guitar. Um, there's no record of him ever performing. Doesn't mean to say he didn't, but there's no record of it. Uh, we do know that uh, he must have been associated with Schubert and Schubert's circle because of some of the dedicatees of, of his pieces, but also because Schubert arranged one of Maciejka's pieces. And it was thought for a long time to be by Schubert, which tells you something about the quality of Maciejka. Um, and as a piano teacher in Vienna in the first decade of the 19th century, there's no way that he wouldn't have been aware of what Beethoven was doing with the piano. 
And some of these things creep into his music. I mean, you know, we can't say that Machaca is writing things like the Pathetique Symphony or the Hammer Clavier, but there are certain formal and rhetorical gestures in Machaca's music which are very much Beethoven esque, certainly of the progressive uh, uh, zeitgeist of the time, you know. Um, and also, he's got this more conservative Haydn style as well. So we've got the two styles often in the same pieces. It's very interesting musically. Yes, I, um, uh, not too long ago, I got a copy of the, I'm forgetting now which sonata it is, but one of the sonatas was adapted from the Haydn piano sonata. Yeah, that's Opus 23, yeah. And that's a very interesting case because those, that, that set of about six Haydn sonatas were never, pub well, they weren't published until much later. Uh, and they're unusual for Haydn. They're, they're kind of so-called Sturm und Drang period. And uh, they only circulated in manuscripts. And one of the manuscripts was at the seminary in Kremser, where, where Macheka was studying piano with Jelinek, who knew Haydn. So we know where Macheka got this piece from. What's interesting is that Haydn wrote that sonata for... Um, harpsichord so there are no dynamic markings but in Macheka's version it's full of dynamic markings presumably they're his they may have been his teachers but that's an interesting thing and uh, Macheka you know he didn't just transcribe it for the guitar you know he did quite a bit of rewriting so, so to fit it on the guitar but he brought it kind of up to date uh, you know he adds a very rhetorical forte octave passage at the very end of the sonata which is a very romantic or pre-romantic gesture so it's a good example of, of Macheka's mixture of styles where it takes a literal conservative Haydn minor mode sonata and then adds more contemporary progressive rhetorical touches to it yes I, I found that for myself that the comparison measure by measure of uh, Macheka's and Haydn's Show really give gave me a window into Macheka's musical mind and mm. how deeply and freely and imaginatively he thought of the musical materials that Haydn had originated and then brought them into the world of something to play on the guitar. Far mm. from a literal transcription, for sure. Right. Yeah. Really wonderful. So, in that for that matter, I think. He, He's pretty noteworthy for how many sonatas he wrote. And yeah. uh, compared to some of the other famous uh, guitar composers. Well, you... there's only one composer for the guitar who wrote more guitar sonata forms in that period. And that was Carulli, who mm -hmm. wrote probably around 30. <laughs> but um, yeah, 12. One lost, so 13, but 12, yeah. Um, which is more than all the, that's more than all the other Viennese guitarists combined at the time. Um, yeah, so it shows his interest uh, in, in kind of serious forms. And, you know, the guitars, well, the Sonata in general have been very popular in the last couple of decades of the 18th century. Lots of recreational pieces written along those lines. But in the early decades of the 19th century in Paris and Vienna, the sonata was really fading away as a popular genre for publishing. So uh, really, the, the, what happened, especially in the piano, is that the only sonatas that got published were really serious ones. <laughs> and I'd like to think that Macheka, Diabelli, Giuliani in their sonatas are joining in a little bit with this idea of a sonata not just being something to throw away because people want to buy them and play them at home easily but actually uh dealing with actually you know the compositional challenges of taking a very simple musical form and elaborating it into something that's not predictable and Macheka certainly did that and another thing which i think uh is that it seems that his sonatas are far from repetitions of one formulaic approach that there's a very large variety in approach and 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 the formal structures of them as well well yeah very wide variety he has the two basic styles that we talked about the kind of haydn-esque monothematic style motific and then the more progressive 
contemporary Viennese style with more expansive forms and cleverer, cleverer ways of getting from one section to another. You know, a terrible sonata, you can just analyze it like this because it's, you know, but, but, but the game for these composers was to, uh, well, to play games with, with transitions and sections and, and do clever things. And, you know, so Machetka has the subdominant recapitulations that you sometimes find in Mozart and, and Beethoven, which then allows him to do another transition to have a tonic recapitulation and therefore you expand that section that re to much bigger proportions without it being boring there's lots of things like that in, in Machenka uh, and you know his, his key schemes and uh, development areas and episodes um, and, and 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 some of his forms are, are so in interesting that uh, the opus 17 sonata which is a sonata uh, progressive, meaning it's for serious recreational players rather than a fatule one for just, you know, easy. And um, in that piece, I've never seen this in any other sonata from this period. And it doesn't mean to say it doesn't exist, but he defines each area of his form with new character and tempo words. Very interesting, you know. Absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Another part of his work that I find interesting is his guitar technique and some of the things that he uh, used in his music that would be unusual for guitarists of today. And I was wondering if you could perhaps take us through some of the, um, briefly some of the techniques that he used, for example, use of the left hand thumb on bass notes and so forth. Yeah. So. You know, in Italy and Vienna, the, using the left hand thumb over the neck was very common. Uh, but for us today, it can be very awkward, especially with the wider necks. But, um, you know, passages uh, like, like this, for example, when we, but much easier to do the bar, but just very often very awkward very awkward um, left-hand dispositions, but on a very smaller neck. I don't think they were, that Macek was playing like this. I think he was playing like this, kind of quarterly. It's very similar to the Russian guitar at the time, extensive use of the thumb moving all along here while the fingers are engaged. But for us, this can be very challenging. So we need to um, refinger a bit, you know. There are very few places though where you can't figure something out. Yes, I think the only time I've put my thumb over was in a, a Diabelli sonata. You, there's just no way to hold this chord without putting the thumb over. But uh, you've got to be careful not to uh, disjoint it. <laughs> that that is that's very important. Um, so, <clears throat> what about some of the uh, right hand techniques? Yeah. So, um, just by his the fingerings contained in his music, and uh, and some of the context. He basically was using one finger per string and repeating fingers on a string rather than alternating, which this was Carulli's method of playing as well, at least in the first instances of his guitar method. He later changed his, his right hand system. But yeah, basically one finger per string. And bearing in mind, you know, this is a brand new instrument with no real accepted pedagogy or performance practice or anything. They're making it up as they go along. But uh, when things get faster, when you can't use one finger per string, then he switches to uh, a technique he calls with two fingers. And what's he mean? You would think, oh, that means I and M, you know, pizzicati are two fingers, but, but it's the thumb and the index, kind of a, like a lute technique. So uh, just that kind of thing. And when he wants to go very fast, he switches to a technique he calls um, uh, Pizzicato, uh, a, a, tra a three fingers. So this would be the thumb, the index, and the middle finger. And then we get some. Uh, very fast passage work is possible with, with, with this fingering. We also have kind of arpeggios where the thumb and the index finger will share a string. So these techniques actually. Um, 
on the surface, they appear archaic because it's not following our regular system of three fingers, but they actually are very, they have a lot of utility. Uh, and um, for this music, of course, they work really well. That, they work very the, well. That's the way that, that, that you know, that, that he, he conceives of playing it. But we can use these techniques in, our, in other repertoire in places. It's a very, this uh, reliance on the thumb for lots of things is, I think, a good thing. Absolutely. And I, I've looked at this, his music for a couple of seasons now. It's pretty much new to me. And if I use contemporary fingerings and compare it to the fingerings that are suggested and are really notated in your, uh, in your book, there's a very different musical effect. So it's well, not just yeah. it's not just technical um, facility that they made. Well, we have to assume that these guitarists were using fingerings that made their music sound the way they wanted it to sound. Now that doesn't mean that we have to slavishly use only their fingerings. You know, I think we should use our ring finger from time to time. <laughs> but um, uh, it's um, it's just something that. Uh, well, if you play sore, for example, we can play that with all kinds of fingering systems. We could use a Tarega, Tarega's fingering system. We can use a contemporary fingering system and we can play the pieces with those fingers. But if we use source fingerings, which again, really focus a lot on the thumb and, and not doing much alternation, but slurring, uh, it just is easier to do and sounds really good. So, you know, these historical fingerings are w worth considering. And Macheco gave us quite a lot of them to, to, to look into. And, uh, you know, it, it's, um, yeah, it's very interesting and it improves our technique, actually. Absolutely. And so one other aspect of his music that is completely fascinating is the real abundance and richness of all expression markings. Oh, much yeah. in contrast to the other 19th century guitar first editions which often have almost nothing not even not even one dynamic marking is very well, i think if you look at the complete works of soar you'll be lucky to find a dozen express uh, dynamic markings in the whole lot <laughs> but in vienna though there was um there was definitely a move towards well notated guitar music and diabelli has some very um, detailed expression markings in his guitar pieces. And Giuliani, of course, often has very detailed expression markings. But Cheka has a, a, a lot. And, you know, there's a kind of a, there, well, there has been a, in, in guitar culture a bit of a dynamics come next or something. I mean, we all learn from the source studies and there's no, no expression markings in there. And so the tendency is to play that music in a, rather flat manner. But I think there's also a little bit of blindness, you know, um, these markings are extremely useful. But we have to work out what they mean, how they function, and to what degree do we do them. So the idea of a of a sport sando being a loud note is one thing, but a sport but a sport sando being a longer pushing note So stress, an emphasis through length and dynamic, and of course, doing these things very subtly, not just banging things out, but accentuating uh, in ways that are appropriate for what's happening in the music at the time. This takes a lot of uh, thought for us today because we've lost that tradition and we have to rediscover it. Uh, you know, what does it mean to play forte? What does it mean to play piano? Well, it's not just about how much noise you make. It's about the quality of the sound and the feeling of the sound and the character of shouting rather than whispering and what those things mean. Playing a passage assertively rather than playing it seductively. All these kinds of qualities, you know. Um, so it's fantastic to have all the markings, even though you have to figure out which notes they belong to sometimes. And there are lots of mistakes in them as well. 
But, you know, just to work out what does PF mean? What does FP? What's RF? What's the difference between RF and SF? What's the difference between SF and an accent sign? Now, you can look in any dictionary you want. You won't find out. You can only figure it out from the context of playing a lot of music. And these Fort Sandals are pressure and pushing and pulling and accent signs often just mean, hey, here's a, a line, here's a melody line that you need to be aware of. And anyway, you know, um, it takes a lot of technique to make those differences uh, clear, but not exaggerated. So that it's just distasteful, let's say, which is a subjective assessment. Uh, so, so it takes a lot of technique, but it takes a lot of internal hearing as well. But this kind of engaging with these pieces in this way is going to improve the way we play any other music, in my opinion. Absolutely. And engaging in his works also means for me very directly is that when I look at a piece of uh, Giuliani or Sor or Guado and I see the vast emptiness and lack of articulations and expression markings, it's really an invitation to use that thinking and the benefits of uh, having worked on Macheca's yeah. works and apply them tastefully and and with a lot of exploration to this music. It transforms yeah. it. So that you know, there are obviously there are differences in style between that little period of Viennese guitar music and say what was being written in Paris or what was you know, being written by Sword. There are definitely differences in style, but you're absolutely right. It provides us with information, the kind of information we can bring to bear uh, in response to the musical shapes of music that's published without anything. You know, the, the Carcassi Opus 60 studies are, are like a textbook for learning how to do this. Even though that again is Italian kind of bel canto, but um, yeah, so definitely. I mean, it, it, if, if nothing else, it, it gives us more technical control in these matters and it opens up our ears to being more sensitive to the subtleties and the details of music, which on the page looks very simple, but in reality isn't. It's very sophisticated. I <clears throat> um, wanted to mention and, and ask you about your um, edition from a few years ago of the complete solo guitar sonatas of Macheca. And in it, uh, you bring to bear all these kinds of things that we're discussing today in, in great detail. Uh, can you tell us about what, uh, what brought to mind the creation of this book? Because I know that it, it seems to be a uh, fruition of many, many years of uh, study and contemplation and investigation well uh years ago in the late 90s sometime around there i got as i mentioned i got interested in sonata styles guitar sonata styles and all this kind of stuff and started collecting uh, amassing uh, you know over a hundred of them i'm sure and uh, so i was planning a, a multi-volume publication and i typeset a lot of it did some of the writing and then my publisher decided it was too big a thing for them to do. So I just kind of put it aside until just a couple of years ago. And a, a colleague just sent me a text out of the blue. Hey, Stanley, you need to put that, out that uh, edition of Macheca Sonatas. So it was Christmas break. And I thought, all right. <laughs> so I'd already got it all typeset. Mm. I probably had the editorial fingerings. Now, fingering is uh, a, a tricky business. Should you include fingerings or not? Well, it depends what the goal of your edition is. Um, I'm trying to promote music that's not very well known and get people on board with it. And I know that a lot of students, for example, and amateur players are not going to be happy with an edition that doesn't have fingerings. Plus, there are some uh, idiosyncratic things that, well, what? how do you do this exactly? So, you know, I want to provide solutions to those things, but I use a very light typeface for fingerings and put them outside the staff so that hopefully players who don't want to see my fingerings can ignore them. But anyway, you know, that, that you know, that's not a difficult thing to do, the fingering and the typesetting is a bit 
difficult because you ha I just feel that you have to do the typesetting with some level of excellence, really, especially in these days of self-publishing. The typesetting has to match the quality of the music. You can't just let Finale or whatever the program you have churn it out. You've got to make that typesetting look like a Henley or a Baron Writer edition to the best of your ability. So there's all that. But what takes the time is the research, looking into the background and just finding things out. Now, of course, I already had Mario Gorio's four-part article that was published in Il Fronimo in the 80s. Uh, but I started to do a bit more. You know, I wanted to know more about Machedka's position in Viennese musical life. So I looked at the dedicatees of his music and found out that there were some very interesting people. You know, um, he was obviously associating with um, uh, the, the, the Austrian commissioner of war, Joseph Preninger. And uh, the and Count Jean Esterhazy, you know that that's the family that patronized Haydn, and you know the the court war counselor, um, a musicologist, uh, Kesem Vetter. He's, he's a so and, and and members of nobility, you know, he's associating at a pretty high level. And I wanted to know that. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you know, I, I need to talk about his musical style and his models for his compositions were what are the sonata styles that provided models and and then of course his guitar technique and the way that he uses the guitar because it's in some ways quite particular to him so all this is important information and i even added an appendix which i don't usually engage in kind of formal analysis because it is pretty boring but i just felt i needed to point out some of the interesting features of these sonatas as an appendix for those who wanted to look at it. And of course, predictably, when I released this edition, one prominent reviewer just said, well, this is boring formulaic music. And it's like, well, this entire edition was meant to demonstrate that it's exactly not that. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I've, I've always taken the same approach with my editions. I just want to publish what I wanted when I was a student. And what I wanted was an accurate edition that gave me lots of information. Well, that that um, certainly does. And I think that the appendix, appendixes, uh, I find it extremely useful for me because in contrast to, let's say, an educated Viennese public in the early 19th century, those uh, today, the, the subtle variations and gestures of sonata form is something that is not native to my own hearing whereas uh key changes dynamic changes and so many things uh for the viennese audiences those are things that the audience would have intuitively or by education understood immediately upon first that's a, hearing that's an interesting point you know the, the way that we're taught sonata form in school and periodic phrase construction and so forth just doesn't tally very much with hardly with, with with it doesn't tally with most music written in sonata style in that period it's just an abstraction that's almost useless and it certainly is an easy way to think that guitar sonatas are not very good because the development sections aren't contrapuntal or that you know there's a complete misunderstanding of what sonata form is and how it works in our kind of school you know way of dealing with it but what's interesting about an informed public or a contemporary public in that time are the kind of intertextual topics that composers brought into their music. So in, an, in, in something that might appear to be an abstract sonata for piano, composers are bringing in all kinds of external ideas that audiences of the time would have immediately recognized. So when there are little things that imitate horn calls, well, what does that mean? Well, it means not, it doesn't just mean here's some horns because uh, um, and, and it's evoking hunting. It's like, well, what does hunting really evoke? What what is the chase? What's being chased? Men are chasing women, uh, and these ideas of Arcadian pastoral virtue, you know. There's, there's so much external stuff being brought into these pieces, orchestral gestures gestures from uh especially comic opera but gestures from opera so when you have a dramatic diminished seventh sequence or something it's usually in the opera would be illustrating lightning 
And, and there's all that, so this was a vocabulary that every composer and every listener was familiar with. So there's a, there's a kind of layer of narrative going on in these supposedly abstract pieces that, a, that a, an informed listener of the time would have been completely aware of. When you have bits of counterpoint, it's religious, it's serious, you know, uh, witticisms, uh, you know, all kinds of things being brought in. With, and they all have meanings, rhetorical meanings. We have to re-educate re ourselves to this and become sensitive to it. You know, it's a very interesting, interesting aspect of, of 19th century music, this idea of topics, external topics, orchestral, violin. In the guitar, it's keyboard, violin, um, orchestral, trommel bass, you know, all these kinds of things. But also these gestures, these operatic gestures that we know what they mean because they occur repeatedly in operas and they have text. <laughs> so, you know, we know what's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is this has been great. I want to thank you so much for joining us today and opening up the uh, the really very wide and fascinating subject of the works of Macheka. And uh, for those of you who have followed the interview, please take note that at the uh, end of it, in the end notes for the YouTube video that will be published soon, uh, there will be links to uh, Stanley's book, website, and so forth, so that for those of you who wish to expand the information and directly get involved in this fantastic uh, subject of um, 19th century music and this fascinating and really underappreciated composer, you'll have uh, resources to get going with that. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure.